This episode of Where Did the Road Go is brought to you in part by our Patreons. In particular, this month is being sponsored by Lindsay Marie Trebet, UFO Weekly News, Eric Hervin, and Nick Martin. I thank you all so very much. And if you want to become a patron, you can do so at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And now our show. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And I am talking tonight with Jack Hunter. How are you doing, Jack? I'm good, thanks. How are you? I am great, and I've been looking forward to talking to you for quite some time. Yeah, Uh, it's taken a while to get together. It has, and uh, we have a whole nother book to talk about at some point, but uh, your new book (laughs) is called Greening the Paranormal. Mm. And this just came out, right? Yeah, it did. Just at the beginning of August, it was, or middle of August. Okay. Do you, do you want to tell people a little bit about your background first? Yeah, well, my background is basically um, I'm an anthropologist by training, um, and I have a PhD in social anthropology. And uh, my PhD research was based um, with a bunch of spirit mediums in in Bristol, a city in the UK. And I, I sort of researched this group for about seven years while I was writing my thesis. And over that period... You know, I, I delved into the into the paranormal. Um, I established a journal, Paranthropology, about anthropological approaches to the paranormal. And um, yeah, I've just been kind of following, using my kind of skills as an anthropologist and the kind of the way that anthropologists look at the world and exploring the paranormal through that kind of lens. And it's taken me down these interesting routes, ultimately ending up with my most recent book, Greening the Paranormal, which is all about the connections between paranormal experiences, um, extraordinary experiences and religious experiences and all those kinds of things, and ecology, um, so that, you know, the living world around us, the, the relationships between living animals and plants and all those kinds of things. And it might sound like, you know, quite a, a tenuous link, but actually, I think the book demonstrates that there are these kind of deep threads underlying the paranormal and ecology, which, you know, which is what the book is really about. Yeah, yeah, it is a really good book. Uh, and it's a collection of essays, for the most part. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I wrote the introduction for it. So the introductory chapter is kind of like my contribution to it. And in that chapter, I kind of lay out you know, where I see this kind of discussion going and the kind of threads that I detect in it. Um, but then the individual authors with their chapters take up, you know, particular themes or different avenues of, uh, of the link between ecology and the paranormal. So it's quite a diverse book, really. Yeah, no, it definitely is. It goes all over the place. Uh, yeah. you, you have everything from paranormal to cryptozoology to yeah. s- some more uh, almost um, new age-ish sort of ideas in here as well. Yep. So it's, it's, yeah. a, it's a very open perspective on it. Yeah, I think you've got to be like that because, you know, th- this is one of the things that I write about in the introduction. You know, there's no such thing as like an uh, academically respectable elements of the paranormal, but we have to kind of investigate all of them, like the new age and the paranormal poltergeists, all of that kind of weird stuff and psi. I mean, as soon as you start to delve into one of them and you think that that's like the academically acceptable thing to, to look at, say, for example, like, um, like psi and telepathy and those kind of things, it's relatively reasonably okay to research that kind of stuff in university. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't take long before you end up, you know, remote viewing, uh, you know, <laughs> secret bases on the moon or, you know, <laughs> coming into contact with Bigfoot and UFOs and all these kind of things. So that's why I like to take this kind of broad approach to the paranormal. It doesn't make sense to try and remove these elements from each other. They automatically kind of intrinsically lead into each other. And why why do you think that is? I mean, people will often accuse me of thinking it's just one thing, but I don't necessarily think it's just one thing, I, but I think they're connected somehow. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I mean, and the book is not trying to say, for example, that all, you know, 
um, ghost encounters are encounters with the spirits of the trees and things like that. It's not trying to be that that kind of simplistic, but it is suggesting that there are these, you know, these other strands to the to the mystery that need to be taken into consideration. And if we don't look at those, if we don't look at the whole picture, then we're missing out on a big chunk of it. So I'm not saying like you like you're saying that it's all necessarily one thing, but I think there is something that connects them all. And perhaps that thing that connects them all is actually, you know, human experience and human consciousness or, or something along those kind of lines. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think some of it is us. And, and that's mm-hmm. talked about in this book a little bit, too, that, that it's sort of a part of us externalizing. But that doesn't exclude an other from being present either. No, exactly. Yeah, I don't think you, that you can exclude this other. I mean, it doesn't take long when you're looking at you know any kind of paranormal experience to realize that there is there seems to be something else going on beyond the experiencer. Because if it was all you know, if it was all generated by the experiencer, then the kind of the phenomena that we that we experience would be you know they would kind of make sense to us, or they they would have some kind of a grounding in our you know knowledge and understanding if we've generated it but in a lot of cases paranormal experiences seem to surprise us and shock us and to me that suggests that you know there's something about them that is external the, their power to shock us means that they are you know something other when when you start the book you start talking about how we're, we've sort of lost our connection to the earth and and we hold ourselves sort of separate from it um, and, and you point out that it's, it was initially religion that sort of did that, but science is, also plays a role in that sort of a, a viewpoint. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. In the book, I talk about how um, religion through these kind of ideas, especially in the kind of monotheistic religions, ideas of kind of dominion over the creation of God so that, you know, we're kind of like looking after it and God has kind of moved away and how that has led to you could argue, you know, looking at, the, you know, the history of it, the medieval church and how all of that impacted society, that that has in part led to our distancing from nature. And like you said, science has also done that with, a, you know, this idea of Cartesian dualism, for example, of separating, you know, separating ourselves from, from matter, basically, and making us feel as though we're detached from the natural world. Um, but yeah, I think both science and religion have contributed to that, but also, you know, they, they, religion especially offers a kind of, uh, another way to remedy it as well. Um, especially if we think about the impact of materialism and all those kind of things, religious worldviews, you know, with their emphasis on, um, immateriality and the spiritual dimension to reality and all of that kind of stuff, they give us a kind of like, um, an alternative framework for looking at the world. And I'm not trying to say again that religion is necessarily correct or any of the religions are necessarily correct, but they do give us this alternative perspective. And one of the most interesting things that I found while researching my introduction to this book was that um, religious organizations sort of in the, you know, after these big um, climate meetings had issued these declarations arguing, you know, that uh, if you follow a particular religion that you should, you know, be trying to look after the world as part of God's creation and all, all of this kind of stuff. But they often brought up this idea of the cosmos or um, of the universe or whatever as a, an expression of God's body. And when, when we start to think like that, we're starting to see again this like what we were talking about before, these interconnections and things coming in, that everything in the world is somehow connected. And I think that's quite a useful way of thinking about things. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, everything affects everything else. You don't have anything that stands alone in a void. No. Um, go ahead. Yeah, so um, that was like the, this kind of, the basis of the idea of greening the paranormal came from this um, greening of religion phenomenon that's been going on where the, the world religions have slowly been coming to realize that they can um, have an impact with their huge you know their huge demographics that they reach out to that if people could frame um, their kind of pro-environmental behavior you know like uh, tackling climate change or 
incre increasing habitat for biodiversity and all those kind of things, if they could frame that within their kind of religious or their metaphysical or spiritual worldview, then, you know, it would make them want to participate more. And I think a similar kind of effect could happen with the paranormal. You know, all of the people who are interested in the paranormal, who are engaging and thinking about these things, you know, we could put that to use in a way. Um, <laughs> it's a bit of a crazy idea, but it's one of the ideas that I explore in the book. Well, one of the things I liked is you said, like, Bigfoot hunters could, you know, plant trees while they were out Bigfoot hunting. Yeah. Yeah, and UFO group set up um, stargazing gardens yeah, yeah. for biodiversity, which I, which I think would be really good. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, that's kind of like a surface approach to the issue, really, and it's not really what the book is about no, in but itself. It, but it amused me. It, it's not a horrible <laughs> idea. No, it's a nice idea, and it, it would be good if that happened. <laughs> and and the, thing, the thing about environmentalism is it's a win-win. Like, it, it doesn't you'll get this overly politicized argument about what's causing climate change. And of course there are people who deny there's climate change going on, but in the end, if we clean up the planet, it's a win-win, even if it's not, if it turns out that, it, that, that climate change is happening naturally and it's not man-made cleaning the planet is still a win. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's, there's no, you can't really make an argument against it. It's like, you know, you don't want to clean up the world. You don't want to clean up the oceans. You don't want to get rid of all of that plastic, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. it, it, it's kind of a non-point what the cause is, and we should probably stop arguing about it and wasting time and just fix things as yeah. best as, and best also, as we can, you know? You know, things like nature connectedness and feeling as though we're a part of the natural world. It's also good for mental health and all of those kind of things, you know? Th there's lots of dimensions to this that are really important to, you know, we've got to think about it in this bigger context. Yeah, you and you know the more deforestation and stuff like that happens, it, it really, it, it it's I guess probably increasing that disconnect from yep. uh, from ourselves in a way. I mean, if this is part of us, it, it's it's mm -hmm. it's giving us a disconnect from ourselves, from the planet, from everything around us that we are intri intricately connected with. Yeah, I mean, we've evolved alongside all of these uh, different species of plants and trees and animals for you know thousands and millions of years and we don't really know what it would be like to live in a world that doesn't have these you know the rich biodiversity that we have now and chances are you know and the way things are going it's going to lead to some kind of a, a catastrophic you know collapse we're not going to see the collapse happening until it's already happened and there's no mm. suddenly there's no insects there's no you know the, the trees are not being able to be pollinated anymore Right. And all of those kinds of things. So it's just a you know total system breakdown potentially. Yeah, if, not if, good. if one part of the system breaks, it's going to affect all the other parts of the system. Yeah, and that includes us. Exactly. And and I've also oh, oh I've thrown around the speculation that what if we can't leave this planet? You know, I mean we're we're so eager to get out into space, which I'm totally for. Um, but what if we're so connected here that getting out into space is not something we can do? It's possible, yeah. I mean, maybe we are, you know, a part of the Earth in some respect. I like, I really like the idea that we are, you know, the universe experiencing itself, that kind of idea, mm -hmm. that maybe we are the, the expression of, the, of Earth consciousness, you know, in ourselves, which is an interesting idea. <laughs> or, or the idea that, that we are, yeah, the universe, exp you know, experiencing itself, but also growing from the inside. Yeah. You know, we're not we're not we're not in a static system, but we're actually creating something new by by existing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, th I think you know, to a certain extent, that's true, isn't it? We can't can't really argue against it. If you take evolution and all of that kind of stuff seriously, then we really are the manifestation of the universe. You know, going right back to the beginning of the Big Bang. You know, when all of the matter was created or whatever, we're the you know, the end result of that flow of, of activity, aren't we, all the way through. <laughs> so we definitely have to be the universe experiencing itself. There's no other way that it really could be. <laughs> and and, and there's, there's a few arguments in here on uh, what came first, matter or consciousness. It seems most people in the book choose consciousness as the, mm. the initiator. Yeah. Which, which is tricky. Is, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. It's, it's tricky territory, isn't it? It's a... Uh, 
it makes more sense when you look at it that way, really. Like when you look at this, the, the reason this phenomena doesn't fit a scientific viewpoint at the moment is because science puts matter first. But if you put consciousness first, all of this stuff makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I think there is. There's a, again, it's part of this disconnect from nature, isn't it? It's the same, it's the same issue that our worldview, based on materialism, doesn't allow for the existence of, you know, of um, disembodied consciousness or tree spirits or anything like that. Mm -hmm. the, one of the most interesting things that's happening recently, and again, I touch on this in the introduction, though, is how modern science is, in a way, beginning to open up to the idea of other forms of intelligence and other forms of consciousness. And the example that I give in the introduction is the, uh, the recent research on plant neurobiology, yeah, and especially the work of Monica Gagliano, who's been, uh, who basically, she concocted all of these really interesting experiments to test for things like memory in plants and perception in plants and hearing in plants and things like that. But her community, her ideas were kind of inspired by communications she'd received from plant spirits um, during vision quests and, and things like that. So it's just interesting how, you know, although the materialist framework of, you know, of modern science has detached us from nature, it's also in a way now with these new avenues of science opening up, you know, opening up the possibility for us to reconnect again. So now that science reveals to us that plants do indeed have some kind of a sentience and consciousness, now we can begin to interact with them on that level and build up a new relationship. So, you know, science is, it's not all bad. <laughs> well, no, definitely not. <laughs> no. It's just a little stuck in its own paradigm, I think, is, is what happens. And, and that's because of the, the, the way grants and stuff like that work. If you're mm -hmm. not, you know, if you're not following the, the status quo or you're, you're challenging it or you're not producing definitive results, you don't get funded. Yep, it's true. No, it's, not, it's not the science, yeah. it's, the, it's the system. It's the system. It's the, yeah, the culture that dictates what's going on within the system. Yeah. Because if we, if we change the overall, you know, the overall assumptions, if we move towards a, a non-physical or a consciousness first model, then, you know, science would have to adapt and change and be mm -hmm. very interesting. Yeah, who knows what they'd figure out then. <laughs> yeah. I mean, considering what we figured out from what potentially could be the wrong model. Yeah, exactly. I mean, even even if a consciousness first model is not correct in the long run, it still might open up some interesting, you know, take us down some interesting routes anyway. So it's worth taking yeah. a moment to consider it seriously, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And and I think that's that's something people don't always realize is the more ways you view something, the more you're going to get out of it. Mm -hmm. If you come across it only one way, you're you're only going to see that one way. You're you're going to miss other stuff. And I think that's part of the problem with a lot of paranormal research is that. These groups, you know, like like the Bigfoot hunters think the UFO people are crazy, and the UFO people think the ghost hunters are crazy, and the ghost hunters think the Bigfoot yeah. people are crazy, and it's like, you know, there's probably interconnection here. You guys yeah. are missing, you know? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and that's it. When it with the ghost hunters, you know, when you start to research psi and telepathy and all those kinds of things and then you start to enter into remote viewing and then you start remote viewing bigfoots like i said before you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's all connected and you need to realize those connections and and especially with psi because like i i you know evps to me can be very interesting i mean a lot of times they're just noise that people are sort of matrixing onto but there mm. are times where people where i've heard very good evps from people i know didn't fake it who got legitimate evps but then i start wondering Where's the source? I mean, they're assuming yeah. the source is a spirit, but the source could just as well be them. You know, yeah. they could be imprinting on the tape without realizing it. And it seems to be that as they do this stuff, uh, the better EVPs they get. And it's mm -hmm. like, okay, so are you communicating with the spirits better or are you projecting on that tape better? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, this is one of the big problems with any kind of... Uh, mediumship research really it's called in parapsychology they call it the the psi versus super psi the survival versus super psi uh, mm. debate 
So on the one hand, you have survival, which is the idea that there are actually discarnate spirits that are out there and that they communicate through mediums and that's how mediums get their accurate information. And then there's the super psi hypothesis, which basically suggests that, you know, if psi exists, then there's no way that we can rule out the possibility that mediums are extracting the information from directly from your mind or they're doing some kind of remote viewing and going into archives and things and, and getting information in that way. And they, so it's and, a, pr it's a and, tricky problem. Yeah, and it doesn't mean they know they're doing it. They're, we're not suggesting they're misleading people. No, 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 no. But it's just that that's the mechan or the mechanism that by which they do it. Right, and it just it it has a, a camouflage around it. Mm. And it's interesting that at the end of the day, this is the state that we're in with like modern mediumship research is trying to work out whether it is survival or super psi. And actually, you know, you can't really tell the difference between spirits and psi when you look yeah. at it in that perspective. And, and, and even when you have, like, the, the kids who remember past lives, I mean, the, the simplest explanation is that they're remembering past lives, but you can't discount the fact that maybe they're picking up on an information stream somewhere. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's too convoluted, and we don't know enough. Even after 150-odd years of, you know, psychical research, we still don't know enough to be able to tease apart these things. We've got a general idea that there is some kind of a phenomenon occurring, but, you know, whether that is spirits or whether it is the psychology or whether it is, you know, psi or whatever, we, we just don't know. And that's why I think we need to keep this kind of open mind, this open perspective on the paranormal, because chances are, you know, the big, the big you know, discoveries that we're going to make in the future that really change the paradigm are going to come from, you know, somewhere that we're not expecting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it might come from Bigfoot researchers or it might come from some kind of cryptozoologist out in the middle of nowhere or it might come from mediumship research or it might come from the large hadron collider you know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or all the above yeah exactly <laughs> um you, you talk a little in your introduction about dark green religion and what is that mm, yeah this is a an idea that was put forward by a sociologist of religion called um bron taylor and he wrote a really great book called dark green religion and dark green religion is basically this form of spirituality that seems to emerge from either, you know, ecological or environmental activism. So, you know, people who go out and you know, protest and things like that, and then through their protests develop this kind of sense of spirituality and connection with the world. Or it might come from, say, scientists who spend years and years and years researching a particular ecosystem, and they come to you know, they come to d develop a, a kind of a deeper understanding of it, a more sort of spiritual perspective. So dark green religion is basically the label for this, this form of spirituality that emerges from interaction with nature. And usually, um, Bron Taylor suggests, usually dark green religion kind of emphasizes the interconnections between um, different elements of the ecosystem um, or between different elements of the cosmos or dark green religion might see um, a consciousness or a kind of nature nature spirits um, in the trees or in the mountains in the rocks so really it's it's a label dark green religion is just a label for this collection of kind of yeah spiritual perspectives that emerge from natural particip or participation in nature um, now, one of the other things you, you mentioned is you don't like the term paranormal, which I can't argue with. <laughs> well, uh, I don't actually, I quite like the term paranormal, um, but the, I tend to use it in a slightly different way, okay. maybe. So I think we actually, we should reclaim the word paranormal mm. because um, it is actually a scientific term. Um, it actually comes from, first of all, um, the term supernormal which was coined by uh, the psychical researchers in the 19th century um, because they wanted to escape away from the idea of sort of, you know, miracles and things like that, that you could only understand these weird events through the, the framework of religion. So they came up with new terms for them. So instead of calling them miracles or, or whatever, or wonders, they would call them supernormal events and then it eventually emerged as paranormal. And what they really meant by that was um, you know, phenomena that our mainstream scientific model can't account for yet. 
Mm -hmm. So I think actually, you know, the term paranormal is okay. It's quite a, a useful, quite specific term, even though it refers to a whole low, a whole broad range of different phenomena that science doesn't have any grasp on. It's still quite specific in saying, you know, this is what we're interested in. And also everyone knows what they, what we mean by the paranormal when we talk about it. So, uh, well, yeah, I think it's a, it's a good term. Hmm. Alfred, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I misremembered. I thought you said you, you <laughs> preferred other terms to paranormal. But um, no. I, I think the problem with the term, reclaiming it's a, a good way of putting it, though. I mean, there's mm. too many things that you say paranormal and people think of like uh, psychics on television shows. Yeah, yeah. You know, they don't think of consciousness research as paranormal. No, exactly. No, but, and, and, you know, that, but that's a part of the problem. We don't understand where these concepts have come from. And I think that's why this academic approach to the paranormal is quite interesting because we start to, you know, we delve into the literature and find out where these ideas emerge from and what, who were the thinkers who came up with these terms. And uh, when we know that, then we know what the term really means and then we can start to, you know, to use it again. <laughs> and I like to use it in academic circles because people are a bit shirty about the paranormal. <laughs> It's good to, you know, people know what it means and they're kind of scared of it. So I like to, to use it just to shake things up a little bit. Nice. <laughs> yeah. And the, uh, and you also, you know, you, you def how do you define high strangeness when it comes to this stuff? Uh, that's a good one. Yeah. Well, high strangeness, um, it was a term that came from Alan Hynek's work, you know, the famous mm -hmm. ufologist. And basically, he was saying that, you know, you could have, you could see a light in the sky, and if it's just a, just a single light floating past, um, it might still be an anomalous light, but it has a low strangeness rating, because that's the only thing that you have to, um, to explain, is the, is the light. But if you have an experience where a light comes down and lands in the woods, and your car stops, and, the, you know, the engine dies, and then you have all of these strange marks on your body afterwards... And then that would have a high strangeness rating because there's multiple, uh, multiple different elements of the experience that are kind of baffling and need to be explained. And I think this is, again, coming back to this idea of taking a broad perspective on the paranormal. It's the high strangeness that seems to categorize, that seems to sort of, um, what's the word? High strangeness is like, um, it's the hallmark of the paranormal in a way. Um, if, if it is baffling, you know, if it is, if it has multiple weird things going on at the same time, then it's a paranormal phenomenon. And I think in some ways, high strangeness might also be what differentiates paranormal experiences from things like maybe from religious experiences and things like that to some extent, mm -hmm. because religious experiences can be explained within a framework, um, you know, within the framework of religion, and that makes it make sense. Whereas paranormal experiences, they don't fit into any framework. They're highly strange. They're, you know, they're, they're irreducibly baffling most of the time. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's why I like the term high strangeness, because I think really high strangeness is where the interesting stuff is at. Yeah, definitely. And, and so many researchers, especially like the nuts and bolts UFO people, they're, they're not interested in the really high strangeness stuff. They, they kind of dismiss that, whereas, you know, that's that's the stuff that seems to have the most value in trying to figure out what's going on, because it's, it's giving us a wider perspective of it. Yeah, exactly. But and it, I think, no, go on. Oh, I, but it goes against the nuts and bolts explanation of it. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Uh, but I think that's the challenge of high strangeness, isn't it? It, it is the most confronting aspect of the paranormal, really. It's the most damaging to the kind of status quo and again that's another reason why i think you know, perhaps although although it's tangential in some ways but merging high strangeness and the ecological crisis and all those kinds of things it might shake people up a little bit you know like what high strangeness and the environment whoa <laughs> <laughs> let's uh well, well speaking speaking of things like the ecology and stuff there's so many mm -hmm. messages in both mediumship and then the contact e movement and yeah. and the abduction literature from from UFOs that all kind of connect to saving the planet. Yeah, which is interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Especially the contact e stuff, I find really interesting. You know, in the 1950s, they were talking about um, 
the, you know, the nuclear weapons and all that kind of stuff and the destruction of the earth in that sense. And then slightly later on, when the abduction started in the 60s, things started to get a little bit darker, but this ecological theme continued to, to play through. And I'm just, I mean, I don't know, I don't understand this. <laughs> this is, it's a highly strange element of the paranormal. Why does the ecological theme come through in what are otherwise, you know, kind of like quite terrifying alien abduction experiences? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It doesn't really make sense to me. Um, the contactees, I mean, you know, we like we were saying before, the ecological message is a win-win message. Um, so it's, you know, there's, it's okay, it's a good message to receive, but there's all sorts of other weird stuff about the contactees, you know, about, you know, with lying and storytelling and making things up and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. So it's quite, I find it quite confusing. And I, I find it interesting that this theme is there in the paranormal, but I still don't quite understand it. And I don't understand, quite understand where the message is coming from. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, why would extraterrestrials be trying to tell us this <laughs> well i guess if they were caretakers of some kind of ours maybe well yeah that's true but, but why would be they be so similar to channeled uh material you know yeah and and like kenneth ring's work on the omega project where he he found that people who have near-death experiences and what they think are alien abduction experiences both come back with similar ecological messages or yep. feelings that they need to protect the environment more uh, more of a connection to it yeah, and the same goes for um, the psychedelic experience as well. Yeah. And that, you know, people who have been exposed to psychedelics over their lifetime come back with, you know, a more pro-environmental perspective. So, you know, this, these connections are there, but we haven't explored them, you know, deeply enough. Why do near-death experiences lead to an ecological perspective? <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it's... Just, and, and one of the things I've always wondered about near-death experiences is, is even though the person may physically be dead, they're, they're coming back. So what they're experiencing in a near-death experience may not be what we experience when we die. Yeah, it could it, be some other... It's like an awakening experience. Yeah. Yeah. But, so why, is, why does this ecological message come through that experience? Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, because so, there's a difference, just, just staying with this for a sec, there's yeah. a difference between, you know, between near-death experiences and alien abduction experiences, but yeah. why would there be, why would the same message come through both? Well, why, I, why are there so many similarities between both and the after effects? I mean, their after effects are very similar. Yeah. Yeah, why are the after effects of psychedelics and alien abduction experiences the same? Right, <laughs> it's, right. It's, Anyway, it's interesting. And and why do people on psychedelics sometimes see greys? Yeah, there we go. We're back into it. It doesn't take long to realize it's all interconnected. Yeah, yeah. And and in all of those cases, lights play an important part too. I mean, a lot of times the first step in a UFO experience is a light. And, you know, the near-death experience often involves light. Yeah, lights at the end of the tunnel. I mean, not all of them. Some of them are very negative and dark, but I mean, there are a good number of them seem to evolve light. Light just seems to play a part in all this in a way that we really don't have a comprehension of. And just sticking with the idea of light and, you know, photosynthesis and mm. just another connection with, with plants, how we, we all rely on plants as the primary producers because they are able to transform light into basically usable energy, which we eat through, you know, yeah. all the food, all the food that we eat. So, Light is clearly important on lots of different levels, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Very interesting. <laughs> um, one, one of the chapters deals with the idea of mycelium as a living network, and I find that mm. really interesting. Yes, it is, yeah. Basically, the idea is that um, forest ecosystems below the surface, all of the trees are connected together with uh, this fungus, um, called a mycelium it's called a mycorrhizal fungus and basically they connect onto the the uh, the tips of roots and extend the reach of roots so that roots can get uh, nutrients and then coming back to this idea of the the importance of the sun because um, fungi don't photosynthesize so they have to use the uh, you know the energy that is given to them by the plants 
um, different, you know, they, they, they form a relationship with the roots of the plants so that the fungus can get energy from the plants. And in exchange, the fungus gives the, the plant greater access to nutrients that are further around. It's very interesting. It's like a, a mutually beneficial reciprocal relationship. And, and you, you find that in nature, and it kind of goes against the idea of survival of the fittest. Yeah, it does. It, it suggests that there is, you know, cooperation in nature is just as, just as important as competition, basically. That plants and fungi and animals work together, basically, to, to create the conditions for maximum biodiversity. And that's what we've kind of, you know, what we, we are seeing the destruction of at the moment is this, the maximum biodiversity. We're preventing natural processes from taking their natural course, and that's leading to a collapse of the system. It's yeah. bad. And, you know, of course, it's, uh, the bees are one of the things people are, are most aware of dying out, which yeah. uh, probably has a number of causes behind of it. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, you know, it, we're, when you hit a certain uh, level of society, greed is the norm mm -hmm. you know and these these big corporations and stuff they don't they don't care that they're wiping this stuff out it's not important to them as long as they're making money and yeah. you know they're, they're very good at pitting us against each other while they just kind of sit back and watch yeah yes unfortunately i mean that's just totally off topic but it just makes me think of all of the stuff that's going on here in the uk at the moment mm. <laughs> with our prime ministers and brexit and all of that stuff. Don't want to get into that. Anyway. Right, right. Yes. yes. <laughs> but there are definitely vested interests up there who are, you know, more interested in money than the planet. Yeah. And, and if we lose the bees, we lose potentially everything. Yeah. Yeah. We need to get back to basics, back to the soil, uh, build from the soil upwards. The um, and the other thing about bees, I think even Darwin pointed out that the the bees being an important part of how plants uh, produce yep. doesn't make sense to his ideas of uh, of uh, you know competition of yeah. competition. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, it it all suggests that you know this narrow view of survival of the fittest is you know is just that it's too narrow. And that actually the nat natural world works more through cooperation and interactions, reciprocal relationships. And um, yeah, if we, if there was some way that we could, you know, emulate that with our societies in some way, um, instead of emulating the, the competition survival element and then start to think more about cooperation, then we might get somewhere. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's better to build, build than to, to fight. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, there, there's, and all I wrote about the note, and I think it's exactly what we're talking about now, was symbiotic ecology. And I yes. assume that, that that's basically what we're talking about now. That's what we're talking about, symbiosis. Yeah. Mutually beneficial relationships. Um, so uh, one of the chapters talks about the evidence of psi beyond humans, and I would think at least some people are aware of uh, Rupert Sheldrake's work with dogs, but it goes beyond that. Yeah. Well, the, the, one of the, so, some of the most interesting stuff, I think, has got to do with um, psi in plants. And again, this goes to what, that, this high strangeness thing, because, you know, we, we can relate to animals, we can relate to dogs, you know, because they, they kind of, you know, we live alongside them, we can kind of understand their motivations and their desires and what they're interested in. But plants... They, they express themselves in such a very different way, in quite, a, in quite well, what seems to us to be quite a cold and detached way. They don't seem to express their emotions or whatever in, in the same way that dogs do. And mm -hmm. I think, I talk about this a little bit, but in part that's to do with timescales and the, the, different, the different timescales that we live on. Plants express themselves over much longer periods of time than we do. Um, and they, they move much more slowly than we do, so we don't relate to them in that kind of way. But then there's this issue then of, of psi in plants and of, you know, it's, it's much more highly strange than psi in animals because, you know, plant consciousness is a crazy thing even in itself. Um, there was a guy called, uh, what's his name? Um, the guy who did experiments with, with um, 
lie detector machines on plants. Uh, mm. Baxter, Cleve Baxter. Yeah. And, you know, his initial conclusion was that there is some kind of a, that plants have some kind of a consciousness, that they have some kind of a, you know, a, a baseline sentience. But then he also started to have telepathic communications from the plants. So they seemed to um, predict things predict his actions before he'd even thought of doing them and, and things like that which made which murkies up the whole territory and makes it totally paranormal again yeah. some of the things i find most interesting you know this new field of plant neurobiology that's emerging how long is it going to be before you know scientists have accepted that plants do have sentience that they do have some kind of a consciousness how long is it going to be now before they say and actually also they seem to have telepathic abilities too <laughs> <laughs> hopefully not too long um, yeah, that, that, that was one of the things you, you mentioned is the time scale thing. And I thought that was really interesting, uh, cause you talk about how this might also apply to the paranormal. I mean, we're, we're looking at this thing in the scope of our time frames, but the paranormal may have a much, whatever, whatever is going on with the paranormal may have a much bigger time frame. And yeah. you see things like, for instance, in the Mothman prophecies with mm -hmm. John Keel, where they, they, John had speculated that some of the information being given to him was out of order in time yeah you know like they're seeing this stuff from a completely different viewpoint you know he compared it i think to if you lived in a, a two-dimensional world and you put your finger or your three-dimensional finger into it the two-dimensional people wouldn't see the finger until suddenly it was there yeah and then as soon as you removed it, it would just disappear they wouldn't see that other range of movement and that so some of these intelligences may be looking at it where time is not a factor for them Mm -hmm. or, or time is just they interact with time in a different way right so one of the examples that i use in the book was um the example of yew trees um and yew trees can live to be you know like two thousand years old you know at least mm -hmm. and it what i found really fascinating when i was reading about yew trees is that you know in a forest you have basically trees compete you know they compete with each other they also collaborate with each other but they compete for sunlight in the forest um so a yew tree has this strategy where it can basically it can wait for it can it can afford to wait like 500 years or something for another tree to grow above it and cover it over because they live for 2000 years so you know after 500 years that other tree is going to die and then it's going to have you know another 1500 years of access to all of the sunlight it's really interesting to think that plants are doing these kinds of long-range stra strategic thinking. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And if plants are doing this kind of long-range strategic thinking, then what about other forms of consciousness that might be out there? And it might help us to understand things like, um, I think I used the example of the Skinwalker Ranch and all of the weird stuff that was going on there. You know, perhaps these things would make sense if understood over a, a different timeline or a different time scale or something that perhaps there is an intelligence there that's trying to make itself known but like a yew tree or something that makes itself known over thousands of years and we might get snippets of uh, perplexing you know apparitions or weird portals or whatever appearing but that's not the whole picture i was also thinking about skinwalker ranch and wondering about the you know, because it, it is a ranch and it's farmed land. And I was thinking about, um, you know, like how soil gets depleted and all of those kinds of things and whether anyone's looked at the Skinwalker Ranch in terms of, you know, the ecology of the place, like how healthy is the land there? Mm. And, you know, perhaps all of this weird stuff, <laughs> this, you know, terrifying weird stuff is an expression of anger maybe that the land has been mistreated or that, you know, that the soils have been depleted or, you know, whatever. Just a line of thought that I thought. <laughs> no, that's interesting. Be. Yeah. I mean, it ties I, in with this whole landscape, you know, ecology. Yeah. That, well, thinking. There, there was a weird comment that the original owners, when they sold it to the, the people who had, were invest, you know, were living there when it was investigated and they told them not to dig on the land. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like and then why, they did why, dig on it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But why? Why would you say that? Like, what? What was behind that? I'd love to know the the origin of that. If it was something very prosaic, or that they knew it was going to stir stuff up. Yeah, and it also rings of you know fairy kind of mm -hmm. stuff as well. Yep. Don't go moving fairy boulders and 
all of that kind of thing. Um, the it, and that makes me think of of like the cycles. Like you see cycles in a lot of this stuff. Um, and are you aware of the the book Robert Schock did on on psychic abilities? Uh, not specifically, though. I do know about Robert Schock's work. Well, he had he had co-authored a book on on psychic research, and one of the things they found is that. In, in government, or in government, in laboratory tests, the psi research, the, the people being tested would perform better during high solar activity than low solar mm. activity. Yeah. And that was, I mean, what he said to me was that it pretty much proves this stuff is real because the only alternative is these people have had a century long uh, conspiracy to only get good results when there's high solar activity. Yeah. No, yeah. But yeah, it, that, I mean, again, the environmental, even cosmic factors that could be at play here. I mean, the sun is millions of miles away, but it still influences, you know, our psychic abilities. Or, mm -hmm. I mean, not mm -hmm. not just psychic abilities; it influences everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know, it doesn't make sense to you know paranormal research shouldn't be just going on, irrespective of all of this other stuff that's going on. It doesn't exist in a bubble. Ghosts, you know, ghosts are not going to be some kind of thing that exists independently of all of these other kinds of processes. It yeah. just doesn't seem to be the way that the world works. But I wonder, sometimes you see, you know, there's UFO flaps and other flaps of activity, especially mm. with monsters, that maybe there's a, a, a another connection there, either cosmic or solar, that initially sets it off. Because then it behaves a lot like a poltergeist, in a way. Like it almost feeds off the people who are it, it's interacting with. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, th I definitely think that there's some kind of, uh, that, that all of these paranormal phenomena are kind of co-created in some kind of way. That it's kind of like a, an interaction between us and something else. Mm -hmm. And maybe that something else does go through these cycles of revealing itself to us. And then, you know, maybe we don't listen to it or we don't understand it and it goes back into hiding or, you know. Laird Scranton's uh, work on like the Dogon tradition and stuff, uh, mm. he in he interprets it as there's what they're saying is there's two universes. There's our universe where we have imperfect knowledge but the ability to change things, but there's another almost mirror universe that they can't change anything but they have perfect knowledge. Right. Like we can change things because we're moving through time. They're static. And they're mm. the ones who are trying to communicate with us. But again, it, it takes that element of time out of the, the question. You know, they're t they're they're experiencing time as a, as as a whole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> that's good stuff. Um, one of the things talked about in here is uh, dreaming plants and animals, and I forget yeah. exactly what that was about. I made the note. <laughs> yeah, I think I only briefly mentioned it, but it's something that I wanted to explore a little bit. In, in a bit more detail in the, in the book, but I never really got around to it. But they found recently um, dream or sleep-like states in trees, where they, especially, you know, like in the autumn when the, the leaves fall, trees go into a kind of like a sleep-like hibernation. And mm -hmm. it seems to, they seem to exhibit, you know, similar kinds of rhythms and things that are similar to dreaming, you know, REM brain rhythms, even though trees don't have a brain in, in that way. And also things like um, detecting REM-like states in squids and uh, the, all of these creatures that are, you know, vastly evolutionarily different from human beings, yet still dream. Um, and we also know from the research of people like Stanley Krippner and the Maimonides Dream Lab that uh, dreaming is associated with, you know, psi experiences. You have dream telepathy and all of this kind of stuff. You also have dream interaction with spirits and premonitions and all of those kind of things. So, you know, dreaming seems to be, you know, it's a big thing. We all do it. And it seems also that, you know, trees and animals and plants also have dream-like states or you know, REM-like states. So do they also, you know, communicate through those states? Do they mm -hmm. also have dream telepathy? Um when we start to open, entertain these possibilities, then, you know, we've got to really start thinking about the best ways that we can make contact with these other than human minds. And perhaps dreaming, something that we all do, is one, one of those ways. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. 
And um, a lot of it, you know, a lot of indigenous traditions communicate with animals through dreams you know, in, mm-hmm. in shamanistic traditions. I remember reading a, an interesting article about how scientists are now going to these traditional uh, traditional people, I think probably in, in the Pacific Northwest somewhere, where they, you know, traditionally will communicate with the whales through their dreams. And the scientists now, you know, trying to understand the you know, the things that the whales do are going to these people with their knowledge of whales and, and asking them. And, you know, and their knowledge comes from dream communications with whales. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know if it was in your chapter or someone else's, but they, they mentioned the difference between alien intelligence versus intelligent Check aliens. Yes. Yeah, that was in my chapter. Okay. Um, it was from a, a book called Alien Intelligence by a guy called Stuart Holroyd. And um, the, it's a really cool book for written in the 70s. He was kind of like um, in the same kind of group of writers as Colin Wilson. Mm. I just stumbled across this book years and years and years ago and read it. it it's all about um, different kinds of intelligence. So he talks about UFOs and aliens. He talks about animal and plant consciousness. He talks about artificial intelligence, you know, way back then and all of these different things and basically he's saying that you know there are alien forms of intelligence forms of intelligence and consciousness that are different from our consciousness um and as soon as we when we when we can accept that yes animals have a form of consciousness trees have a form of consciousness plants have a form of consciousness then it also opens up the possibility that then there are genuinely like alien like extraterrestrial forms of consciousness or spiritual forms of consciousness as well we're really we're dealing with a big spectrum so basically that quote i, I really liked it and i've I've been thinking about it for years and wondering where I could fit it in. <laughs> I finally found the place. But yeah, um, basically saying that if, if we accept the, the fact that there are other forms of consciousness, then it makes it more likely that there are also extraterrestrial consciousnesses and all of that other stuff. I, I, I've always had an issue with um, like scientists saying, well, there's there's no such thing as uh like there's no other life in this solar system you know and it's like well there may not be life like us but how do we know there's not life in the depths of jupiter somewhere that's just so unrecognizable to us that we don't we don't see it for what it is yeah and we're not likely to see it for what it is because we can't even appreciate the intelligence or the consciousness of plants which have you know we've been co-evolving with them for millennia right <laughs> I mean, right we, we, can't, we don't need there the, you know there are debates still going on in you know in governments about whether animals have sentience or whether animals feel pain and all of these kinds of things you know if we're if we're only asking those questions now you know in the t- 21st century then you know we've got a long way to go before we're going to be able to understand extraterrestrial intelligence or you know an intelligence that evolved in another system or an intelligence that evolved in non-physical spaces or whatever or gods yeah yeah uh, so who knows what else exists on our solar system much less our own planet i mean there yeah. could be there could be aliens here but we may be. not recognize them for what they are exactly there's always the joke going around that octopi are alien. Yeah, well, they are pretty strange. <laughs> yes. I mean, they have their, their um, nervous systems, their brains kind of extend out right down into their arms. And I mean, that, we talk about alien intelligence. You can't get much more alien than octopus intelligence. There's mm-hmm. only now that, you know, people... Are, I watched an interesting documentary the other day about... Um, a, a scientist who brought this octopus into his house and they kind of lived with it and I mean, octopuses only live for about a year or so but they you know in that time they were able to build up a relationship they played games with each other you know i think that's all it takes really is spending the time with these different creatures or different plants or different beings and learning to interact with them yeah yeah um uh, you talk about brain activity and trance states as well. Yeah. <laughs> and that's interesting to me. It is interesting, yeah. I mean, um, this is one of the things that I 
wrote about a lot in my thesis was how advances in um, brain imaging studies have made it possible to distinguish between what appear to be sort of mediumistic states of consciousness, um, you know, the state of consciousness the f and the, the neurophysiological state of the brain as well that the medium goes into when they're in their trance and other things that people had, you know, previously tried to explain mediumship away with like, um, you know, dissociative identity disorder or schizophrenia and things. They seem to exhibit very different um, neurological activity, which lends credence to the idea that, they, you know, there is something, you know, whether we're talking about something paranormal or spiritual or, or what is another question, but mediums and psychics and all these guys do do something that is unique. They do change their, their brains change in, in ways that are different to, um, you know, illnesses or uh, seizures and things like that. Which right, is, right. Which is interesting. And even I've I've seen research even on like uh, Jay Z White who you know channeled mm. Ramtha who seems to be kind of a charlatan but yet she was changing her brain state when she was was channeling Ramtha. Yeah, I mean this is totally off the topic of um, of greening the paranormal, but one of the things that I explore in my in my thesis, which will be a book actually next year, um, is this the relationship between fraud performance and trickery and genuine you know paranormal events because if, when you start to look at things anthropologically and we, you know we look at mediums and we look for similar kinds of figures in different traditions different societies around the world and we come across you know shamans and all those kinds of things and then we look at what shamans do and in a lot of cases uh, shamans will use um, sleight of hand um, they'll use tricks um, different kinds of things as a part of their kind of toolkit in a way because what they're trying to do is to you know bring the person that they're treating for example if they're you know if they're doing some kind of a healing ritual they're trying to change their consciousness and magical tricks and uh, you know things like that sleight of hand can all be used for that purpose so I think there's a there's an interesting relationship between trickery and the paranormal and mm -hmm. just because you get trickery in a particular instance doesn't mean that a genuine phenomenon isn't also occurring yeah um, and, and, and that, ma that makes it so hard for some people to accept too yeah i mean we've got a, the, the best examples are you know the mediumship of in the 19th century where you would have um let's say for example a famous medium called eusapia palladino she was investigated by all of the big names in psychical research and at the end of the 19th century and there were clusters of researchers who caught her you know red-handed doing um you know tricks and things and moving things around herself and, and whatnot and at the same time in other seances or on other occasions they were 100 percent convinced that there couldn't have been any trickery that a genuine that genuine phenomena had occurred and there were also occasions when she would do a trick you know, and everyone would see it, and then a genuine phenomenon would happen afterwards, uh, mm. which is pretty interesting. Uh, just another one more thing that relates to this is the work of a parapsychologist called Kenneth Batchelor in the 1970s, and he did. Um, he was interested in you know um, sitter groups and psychokinesis, and he wanted to to produce the kind of séance phenomena, and he found that if he introduced what he called an artifact which was basically a faked phenomenon so maybe something you know triggered to fall off a wall or something or the table was lifted up or he you know he lifted the table after he'd done that and people had been you know had been shocked and excited by the fact that something had actually happened then genuine pk phenomena started to occur so again you know false phenomena and real phenomena kind of intermingling with each other yeah yeah no, it's not a comfortable position to be in <laughs> no but it, but it says something about what effect we're having on it yeah it because does, yeah. It, there's there's no reason spirits would get more excited because uh you know something fell off the wall but uh, us if we start to believe it mm -hmm. are maybe more open to sharing that sort of energy yeah 
that was the thing uh, the thing that Batchelor said was that it's not our overall belief um, so it's not whether we believe in ghosts or believe in spirits or whatever overall but if we believe in them just for that moment just for the moment that it's occurring then we kind of give it the energy in that moment so it's not our overall belief that's important but what we believe at that particular moment yeah um, which is pretty weird and then if you start to think you know the importance of the role of belief and what we think is going on and start to think about and like you know cia disinformation and all of that kind of thing mm. and then people tricking you tricking people but then genuine phenomena happening at the same time you know the whole thing starts to get very very muddy <laughs> um we're gonna take a quick break i'm talking with jack hunter here on Where Did the Road Go about his new book, Greening the Paranormal, and we'll be back in just a minute or so. Conspiranormal Podcast proudly presents The Strange Realities Conference. Strange Realities. Come join us for one day of presentations on the paranormal with live music at night featuring Tim Banal, The Rise and Fall of the Flat Earth Theory, Joshua Kutchin, Alien Hybrid Lore, Joe Damari, Pushing the Limits of Reality, Guy Malone, Roswell 1947, What Really Happened, Timothy Renner, Pennsylvania Wild Man, and added to the lineup, Mark Anthony Wyatt, Cornish Legends and UFO Sightings, Zach Hunt, a Presentation of his book on Rapture, Followed by a live recording of the Conspiranormal Podcast. More speakers and music acts to be announced. October 19, 2019, SIR National. Tickets and info at www.strangerealitiesconference.com. $40 at the door, $30 pre sale. I want to give a shout out now. To my Patreons, without whom this show may not exist. So uh, I would like to give a special shout out to those pledging $10 or more. Allison Cook, Eric Hervin, Lindsay Murray Trebet, Nick Martin, UFO Weekly News, Super Inframan, Tim, Damian Tallman, Edu Camahort, Janet Bunderson, 36 Dingo, Maria, Nate Syria, Jennifer Campbell, Mike McGuire, American Rambler, Paul Buscini, Kevin, John Rutledge Foster, Eric Citron, Andy McNamara, Sasha Yorg, Matthias Sunby, Christopher Vaughn, Riker and Stark, Sean Cosgrove, Jose A., Roger Gonzalez, Craig Cicernos, Ray Benedetto, Lindsey Jackson K., Alfred Tuttle, Kevin Shrek, Patricia Gaiaquinta, William Lovelace, Mark Brady, Chris is a hot dog a sandwich, John Eddy, and Carla Mahoney. Thank you all so very much. Your support is invaluable. All right, I'm back with Jack Hunter, whose new book, Greening the Paranormal, is out now. And uh, A, I highly recommend it. It is a collection of essays, um, and it is a fantastic book. It really is. Um, it has a lot of different viewpoints in here, and one of the things you do talk about, well, not you, but one of the essays talks about is the trickster, and how mm. the trickster may, part of the, the goal of the trickster seems to be a way of forcing new views upon things. So just when you think you got a grasp of something in the laboratory, the, the, the trickster comes in and kind of messes with it. And that, yeah. that's, that seems to be a thing with just the paranormal in general. Anytime you think, oh, we, we got a hand on this, it throws an extra wrench in there. Hmm. Yeah, I think um, we can bring this idea of the trickster back to when we're thinking about um, the possibility of, you know, other than human consciousness or non-human consciousness, or when we're trying to think about what would what would the consciousness of the Earth be like? <laughs> and you know, have you, I don't know if you've encountered Gaia, the Gaia hypothesis, which oh, is yeah. based, yeah, James Lovelock's idea that you know the Earth is a single, basically like a, a living organism. Um, a self-regulating system. Um, and what, one of the things that I find interesting is how ecologists, people like James Lovelock, come to this idea of the Earth as a single living system, but so too do people like John Keel, who spent their whole you know, careers researching the paranormal. And John Keel, in, in a couple of his books, 
puts forward this suggestion that actually the, everything that we're experiencing in the paranormal is basically you know different expressions of an underlying mind or consciousness mm -hmm. and he talks about how this underlying mind or consciousness is basically you know a trickster trickster consciousness that it's a it's a it's constantly shifting um it's so alien to us you know that we can't really get a, a grasp on it and i just wonder whether perhaps this gaia consciousness this the earth consciousness that we that the ecologists uh, talk about although actually you know james lovelock Push, rejects the idea that it is actually a living conscious being um he thinks of it more in terms of you know physical processes but nevertheless mm. lots of other people do think that perhaps we might be talking about a kind of earth consciousness and i wonder whether that earth consciousness might not be you know this this trickster uh, or express itself or the way we interact with it and understand it because we can't comprehend the whole thing is as this kind of trickster intelligence it's interesting you know one, one of the things i wrote down is what if trying to understand the paranormal is meant to lead us to something deeper something that is not broken down through materialist means trickster behavior may very well literally be there to force us to take a different view of how we see this yeah exactly and again we can tie it into the idea of um, sleight of hand and fraud and all of those kinds of you know the more dubious elements of the paranormal which we can't we can't extract that from the paranormal this is one of the interesting things about that i like about the paranormal as well is that it is there's something about it that is kind of pulpy uh, <laughs> i talk about this a lot with with my friends but um there's something about the kind of the the character of the paranormal that that fits well with like pulp paperbacks and that meshes nicely with you know like b movies and all of those kind of things that there's yeah. something about the paranormal that is you know, it, it is trickster-like. It does like to bend the boundaries. It does like to, you know, it, it likes to appear in, in pulpy paperbacks, um, <laughs> not just in academic articles. And I think that's, you know, that's my kind of approach to it. I like to engage with the paranormal kind of like on its own terms, um, trying to understand, you know, that kind of angle on it. I also wrote the message of the trickster is that converting side to technology is not going to happen. Yeah, and, and probably shouldn't happen either. Yeah, that, that was one of the other things I, I wrote down. What, uh, what do you think that, that science would do with this type of stuff if they could get a grasp on it? Yeah, um, probably bend it towards evil, you know, or the powers of bend it towards money or war. Yeah, yeah. Um, Lance oh, it's Foster's... It's, 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 it's already been used in those respects, in a sense, with uh, well, remote viewing and, and stuff in the government. Exactly. And it probably is being used in still in certain yeah. ways. Um, but Lance, I think Lance Foster's chapter in the book um, has a kind of a really good approach to the paranormal. And he, 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 he raises this issue of, you know, what happens when we prove the existence of something, it gets taken and used for you know, nefarious purposes. And he gives this example of um, a Native American leader called Plenty Coup, who had this um, this encounter with a what he called a, a, a river person. And uh, they had, it's all described in the book, so I won't go into too much detail about it. But basically, they're trying to cross this river, and they get caught up in... It feels like they're being kind of like dragged down under the water, and they have to go through this rigmarole of trying to escape from it. And... The moral of the story was really that, you know, these anomalous things kind of are out there. They do exist out there. They're in the river. The river person is there. Um, but Plenty Coup's approach to it was just to say, right, fair enough. We've encountered that river person and we're going to leave it alone now. It's not mm -hmm. to go back there and hunt it or, you know, go back there and capture it and take it back to the lab. Um, it's to say, to acknowledge its existence and then say, right, we're going to leave that alone as a part of the natural environment and forevermore we'll know that as the place where you know the the river person lives and we'll know to to not try and cross the river over there anymore mm -hmm. and you know it, it could be a similar we perhaps we should be taking a similar kind of approach with psi and the paranormal you know we should perhaps be trying to un, you know to observe it maybe and understand it but certainly not to um domesticate it or reel it in or you know, bend it to our will. Yeah, if it can be anyway.
if it can be exactly yeah I mean, you you could say the practice of magic is doing that, but yeah. could it be done on an institutional scale? Because it seems like so much of this stuff is personal. Yeah, it is. Definitely. So when you try to take it out of that personal level and just make it a weapon or just, you know, something to that effect, I, I, I think you lose a lot of the effectiveness of it. You probably would. And again, it's the problem of reduction. Like, if you want to turn it into a weapon, then you have to get rid of all of that extraneous stuff. And as soon as you start to get rid of bits of it, then you lose track of the whole thing. And suddenly your, you know, psychic weapon doesn't actually work. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. And, and it's so unreliable anyway. Yeah, it's just by its nature. Um, there was a quote from... Uh, Jeffrey Kripal. I know I had it written down at some point, and if my thing didn't crash when I was searching for it, I might have been able to find it here. Um, but it, it basically went something along the lines of uh, the, the the paranormal or the supernatural is not is something that happens in your life when you need it. Mm. Yeah, which made which, a lot of sense to me. Yeah, and it might make a lot of sense, you know, with regard to the ecological crisis and why why these themes do emerge through it perhaps we perhaps collectively we do need you know something to shake us up and that's why I, I, but then again you know if there is a mind or intelligence that's trying to convince us to take the earth seriously to take ecology seriously why is it revealing itself through alien abductions <laughs> and near-death experiences and things mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. Well, I think it's, the alien abduction thing is more just our our mask for it. Mm -hmm. Especially when you get into hypnosis, because hypnosis, as they've <clears throat> shown, is not a memory recovery tool. So I, I honestly think that the abduction experience is more like a shamanic awakening that's been yeah. hijacked by a culture that thinks it's aliens. Yeah. So you you hypnotize someone and you convince them now that you know they've been taken by aliens. And those memories are stronger than normal memories. And this becomes this whole system. Like, this, as soon as you see, and the person was hypnotized and remembered this, it's kind of like, so now the muddy, the water is muddy, you know? Yeah, and then if you frame it then, if you frame the alien abduction experience as a sh shamanistic experience, and then based on what we know about shamanistic traditions and animistic traditions around the world, then perhaps it's not surprising at all that this ecological theme is coming through the alien abduction experience. Exactly. That, you know, it's, it's a part of the shamanistic experience, isn't it? And, and it also then makes sense why we have ancient cave paintings that we know basically shamans were responsible for depicting gray aliens because we yeah. know these beings are encountered in vision quests and stuff. Yeah. And it's, yeah, very good. <laughs> um... So the let, let's talk a little bit about liminal minds and boundary thinness because this mm. is something that's always interested me. Now liminality has always been a factor in this stuff. Um, yeah. You know, when you're in that liminal state, is the most likely time you're going to experience some level of psi. Yeah. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, the the, the chapter in the book about um, liminality and boundary thinness is by Christine Simmons Moore, and she is um, a parapsychologist. At University of West Georgia, I think. Somewhere you can you can research that, and um, yeah. So she's taking she's looking at this issue of, of where the where psi and the paranormal um, interact. Not psi and the paranormal, psi and ecology interact with each other from the perspective of parapsychology. And one of the things that she's been most interested in is these character traits of, of well, we know what liminality is, you know, of being betwixt and between and those kind of things, but also of boundary thinness and um, how we conceive of ourselves in relation to the world. And if we find that people who, um, you know, have these thinner boundaries who, who, can, who perceive themselves to be more connected with nature, for example, are precisely the same kinds of people who also report, you know, more paranormal experiences or more, you know, psychic experiences and things like that. Or they're people who have these thin psychological boundaries are, you know, better participants in psi experiments and things like that. So it's, it's, she's pointing out something really interesting, actually, that, you know, our connection with nature, our sense of, of um, you know, how strong our, the boundaries are between ourselves and the other are, uh, 
fundamentally connected to both the efficacy of psi and all of that kind of stuff, but also to the way that we understand ourselves in relation to the natural world. So it's a pretty good, it's a good chapter. Uh, the uh, And that, that also takes off of uh, Kenneth Ring's work too, where he mm-hmm. found that the people most likely to to experience this stuff had certain traits that he yeah. nicknamed the encounter-prone personality. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, that there, there seem to be certain traits or characteristics in people that make them more likely to have certain kinds of experiences. And it's just interesting that they're also the same traits that, um, you know, make people more pro- pro-environmental or, you know, more willing to or interested in doing stuff to uh, to save the Earth. And and liminal spaces are places like Skinwalker Ranch. Yeah. Or sacred sites or mm-hmm. um, places like that. There's a lot of, of writing in the book about the role of sacred sites and how our consciousness, you know, our liminal boundary thin consciousness can interact with the influence of these special places, you know, like we mentioned before through, you know, geomagnetic activity or, you know, radiation in the ground or whatever. There's all mm-hmm, sorts mm-hmm. of different possible, you know, possible uh, factors involved in these experiences. Um, one, one, I guess one of the big takeaways from this is, uh, is having these experiences while having a deep connection to nature, being out in the woods, taking yeah. a walk. And that's when this, these things really affect you. Yeah. And, uh, it's, and that's, that's, that's one of the things that led me to the whole idea of, of, of the, uh, big, you know, what people consider Bigfoot encounters being like a poltergeist thing. Yeah. Because, you know, you have rocks thrown, you have vocalizations, you have the, the knocking, which are all poltergeist things. You never, and these people never see Bigfoot. They just have these, these experiences. And yeah. it makes me think that, is it because we're out in the woods and we're already in that mindset that we're sort of provoking this stuff, like, like unintentionally we're externalizing it as poltergeist activity without realizing it's coming from us? Yeah. And part or of is it something external and an actual is it genuinely the spirit of the wilderness you know mm-hmm, mm-hmm. trying to communicate we go back to this the survival versus super psi dilemma again we can't actually tell the difference between ourselves and the other <laughs> we can't tell the difference between the spirit and our own kind of psychic ability and you know maybe there's actually something in that <laughs> true true yeah um and any haunted place i think you know you got to wonder if it's charging energy from you if you're just manifesting better while you're there but that's Um, it i mean is a place haunted if there's nobody there to to see it (laughs) exactly um there's a graveyard here that i've had all kinds of weird stuff happen in and Mm -hmm. i I like exploring graveyards and it's it's there have been two out of tons of them that i've been in only two that anything weird has happened in and uh i i but they're both old graveyards and i always think was this graveyard put here just because just because or was it put here because this place was already sacred to some degree yeah you know did it already have was it already like well this is a special place this is where we'll put the graveyard yeah it's possible i mean where where i live here in mid wales a lot of the the churches um, I mean, they were built, you know, hundreds of years ago, but they were built specifically on top of older Bronze Age sites, or you know, mm-hmm. older sacred sites, because you know they wanted to, re- you know, supplant the old religions and basically, you know, bring yeah. Christianity in. And I'm sure the same thing has happened, you know, in the U.S. that mm-hmm. the, the native sites will have been taken over, and you know, had a church placed on top of them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're Which is terrible. We're, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, this book, I assume, is available everywhere. It is, yeah. It is. It's available on all the online uh, retailers, and I'm sure it's also available if you go into your, you know, your nuts and bolts shops. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And this is, and this just came out. You have how many other books out there? Um, I've got, I think, six in total. Okay. Yeah. There's some more on the way. <laughs> really? What's next? Yes. Well, um, at the moment, I'm working on an edited book called Mattering the Paranormal, which is going to be a much more academic book. I'm working with another anthropologist called Diana Espirito Santo, 
and it's mm. all about how um, metaphors of technology and things like that have had an influence on the way the paranormal actually kind of is played out in the world um, from quite an anthropological perspective. And my chapter in that is going to be looking at how actually perhaps organic models are a better fit for the paranormal than um, mechanistic models. And so that's mm. one thing. My th I'm also working on my thesis, um, which is my spirit medium research. And um, that's going to be transformed into a book uh, next year. I signed a contract for that. So nice. that's good. Yeah. And where, where can pe people follow you online? What's the best place? Um, I have um, on Facebook, I've got a Dr. Jack Hunter page uh, that you can follow me on. Um, or you can f look at my uh, personal website, which is jack-hunter.webstarts.com. And um, I, I put everything that I do up there. It's got links to my academia pages and things. So you can find my articles. Yeah, I was going to say, I noticed you put uh, stuff on academia.edu. Yeah. Is it uh, .edu? It is. Yeah. Okay. There's a lot of stuff on there. All right. Well, thank you for spending some time with us. That's great. Thank you for having me. And I highly recommend the book. So people, if you're interested in this stuff, even a little bit, go out and read this because there's a lot of important stuff in these essays. So there's an extra Patreon segment with Jack Hunter where we share some personal stories that relate to sort of the greening of the earth concept and the connection between nature and the paranormal. Um, and I hope to have Jack back very soon because uh, I have another book that I've been meaning to talk to him about that came out earlier this year, but uh, we couldn't quite get a date scheduled. So hopefully that will happen very soon. Um, I also want to announce I'm hoping to be at the Albatwitch Day Festival this year that is down in Columbia, Pennsylvania, and it is happening on October 12th. And this is something Timothy Renner is directly involved with. And uh, there's going to be music and ghost uh, tours and a whole bunch of other stuff. But if you want to, you know, meet up down there, drop me a line, let me know, or just find me at the festival. Um, I, I kind of stand out, so you should be able to find me, no problem. Same with Tim. I mean, just look for the wizard, and you'll, you'll find Tim. And uh, also, as uh, I played the ad for in the middle of the show here, uh, the Strange Realities Conference is coming up on October 19th. That's Adam Sane. Timothy Renner will be there. Joshua Cutchin. Um, yeah, so it's uh, some cool stuff coming up. I won't be at the Strange Realities Conference, unfortunately. Uh, it's a little too far away, but uh, I will be hopefully out at Albatwitch, and that's Columbia, Pennsylvania, southeastern Pennsylvania. So come out and say hi. It's a free thing. I think the ghost tours have uh, a price on them and stuff, but the actual festival is free. We went a few years ago with Adam Sane, and it was a lot of fun. And uh, it's apparently much bigger this year and, and uh, has some really cool stuff coming up. So, hopefully, I'll see some of you there. Don't be afraid to come up and say hi. And we'll see you next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons. And we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support. <laughs>